President of Ireland, Michael Lee Higgins. start. May I just say, President, uh, what a great pleasure it is to welcome you to Oris and Uktron. Uh, we're here to in honour uh, Professor Marcelo de Sousa, President of the Portuguese Republic. And I just want to say uh, how welcome he and those travelling with him are to Oris and Uktron. Uh, which has been the home of Irish presidents since 1938. I'm so delighted that you have all been able to join us this evening, Taoiseach, uh, members of the government and members of the Portuguese government, and indeed so many dear friends. Uh, Dear uh, Minister, dear Minister, Bishop, you are most welcome. Uh, and I, I'm so pleased that you have been all able to join us. What is a very, very special occasion. Uh, President uh, de Souza has had a, a long day, including beginning this morning meeting uh, school children, and he, he was able to uh, discuss with them the relative merits of Ronaldo and Messi. <laughs> and it was told by a child from New Market in Fergus that Messi was the best player, that Lionel Messi uh, was much, was, had a, an edge on Cristiano Ronaldo. So <laughs> it's good to know that the beautiful game has penetrated New Market and Fergus. Uh, my own school. May I say that Ireland and Portugal, as I have been preparing our words for this evening, has, of course, uh, a very long relationship. Uh, those interested in archaeology will know uh, that from these connections are lost in the mists uh, of antiquity. But even DNA suggests uh, recently that we may all, in fact, actually, Celts may have been descended from, from peoples in the Iberian Peninsula. And then, of course, on through history, be it in the medieval period and indeed through early history, we have had a continual connection with Portugal. I think that many of the Irish who migrants in times of forced migration uh, through religious intolerance and for other reasons settled in many of the university cities, the university cities of, Lis of Lis Lisbon and Coimbra and Eora. I think as well, and I'm very delighted that they are represented here this evening, the Dominicans. For example, when Spina and I uh, made our state visit uh, uh, to Portugal in December 2015, uh, we had the opportunity of visiting um, a bomb uh, successo, which was founded by the Irish Dominican priest Father O'Daly and Portuguese Countess Iria de Brito in 1639. And it's one of the buildings that has indeed survived the, the earthquake of 1755. And as I said, it uh, represents, I think, uh, a dear friend, I have to say, the late Irish historian, Sister Margaret McCurtain, uh, wrote about the connection uh, between the, the, the Dominicans, the Sisters' Mission in Lisbon, and indeed, of course, the Irish Dominican Fathers' uh, connection, uh, just finished in 2021, after 400 years. There are many people here who I've, I have an opportunity to, to meet again. There are many, uh, it's always, I must say, living in, here in Horus and Uthron. I'm delighted to see former colleagues, uh, uh, so many of them that, are, that uh, I, I see sometimes at a distance, but we hear from each other, as it were. I think as well, there was one very, I, I've always been interested in some of the eccentric and eclectic aspects of our relationship with Portugal. One of the most interesting is a 1645 work, Disputatio Apologetica de Euro Regent, Reni Habernie Pro Catholics Habernis Adversus Hereticus Anglos, which is a wonderful title, an argument defending the right of the Kingdom of Ireland for Irish Catholics against English heretics which was one of the most important documents in the 17th century, making the case for a particular, perhaps now, and it's a perversion of, of, Irish, uh, of Irish independence. 
I think uh, 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 as well, uh, because I see there are people from Cork here as well, there is a particular interesting Mayor of Yall in County Cork in 1559, 55 William Moses Agnes Ianas was elected uh, Mayor. And uh, he was uh, the first member of the Jewish faith to hold such an elected position in Ireland, and he was from Belmont in North East Portugal. I think that in all of these, I think that there is something in our discussions this morning, a very good discussions that we had um, with the President, I thank um, President D'Souza and his, those travelled with him for that. And I think we, tomorrow we will have an opportunity of resuming that conversation in relation to something we share, and that is our joint interest in matters maritime. And I want to take this opportunity of congratulating Portugal to its president for the co-hosting with Kenya of the United Nations Ocean Conference in June of this year. It was so important and it came at a very critical time uh, for, for all of us. In the world, we had, in fact, we were dealing with the problems of the, of the pandemic. But most importantly, above all else, the oceans are what binds us, connects us, and what we share, and they're just so important. I think that the end of the, uh, uh, the discussions in Lisbon led to a very important declaration. And I think I can only describe it as devastating, the consequences of the failure at the level of the United Nations in New York not to achieve a binding agreement. And it is certainly my hope, and I know that it would be the hope of, of President Sousa as well, that we will in fact resume the efforts with urgency uh, to try and move towards achieving a binding agreement on what is so important for all of our futures. But it, it is, I think, uh, as well, there are so many aspects of foreign policy, and I'm delighted the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs and, and Committee is here, Charlie Flanagan is here, uh, and there are so many things we share, as you, not just as EU members, but as people who share values in support of multilateralism, in support of a world that is able to deal with its, its challenges. I very much realise <laughs> we are meeting at, uh, at times uh, of war uh, on, on the continent of Europe, and we are also meeting at times of great hunger in continents such as Africa. I do think that in relation to the values that we share, there are ones of solidarity, inclusivity, equality, and I, I think uh, uh, it is with shock and horror that we continue to witness the consequences of the invasion that has been unleashed against the Ukraine and its people by Russia. It's an action that is imperialist in motive, illegal action, and it contravenes international law, humanitarian law, and indeed the United Nations Charter itself. And I say it really, the, this is a dark time when a, a member of the, a powerful member of the United Nations uh, represents such an action a, against its neighbor. And the flagrant violations of the principles of the United Nations have maybe been tolerated for too long, and by, often by those with the greatest power. I think there's too, as to envisaging our future in our shared European Union, we're challenged, all of us, to advance a critical debate on the future of the achievement of such values as multilateralism, peace, democratic life, security and freedom, including security from hunger. And as members of the European Union, have we joined the United Nations on the same day as Portugal in 1955. And I know we are committed in relation to these values that I have mentioned. But they still remain facing us, all of us, issues such as global poverty. Our papers are full now of references to the third famine in 15 years in Somalia and the Horn of Africa. Horn of Africa that is responsible for 0.23 of the emi emissions but is paying the highest price in relation to the threat to its population at risk and, even, and in relation to its children. We are challenged and I think it is at the United Nations and Ireland's efforts, at the Security Council and Portugal's efforts, in many cases, we cannot go on without tackling what are the underlying structural uh, reasons that are standing behind these repeated famines, including, too, for example, the, the monopoly te monopolistic tendencies in production and distribution of food, but more than that as well, the failure to recognise that in those countries, there are 29 countries on the continent of Africa that are about to head over the precipice of debt. 
I regularly mention the figures now. Of their meagre exports, 16% are spent on, uh, on, debt, on, on debt payments. About 6% on average are spent on public health. This is the, where the role, I think, of countries, President Sousa and I, meeting in, and our fellow colleagues and the Areolas group of non-executive presidents, we regularly discuss these issues, is that we need to reach a new place where we can, in fact, revise our institutions to make them effective in addressing these issues of global poverty, unfair trade, those issues which are affecting displacement and which are driving, if you like, unchosen migration. I think all of this is where smaller countries, in a way, there's no such thing in a really smaller countries when it comes to a moral voice. And I think it is not only then in maritime matters that our two countries share common contemporary interests. All these issues that I speak of, when one looks at the attitude of Portugal, Portugal and Ireland, are on similar page in relation to most of these, be it in relation to inclusivity, equality, cohesion, the future of the European Union. We've had, I think, in the Conference on the Future of Europe, represented a positive step in the realisation of a deeper and more inclusive experience of European democracy. But I think policymakers will need to use the experience as a catalyst for a more comprehensive change that enables us to engage with the European streets in a more effective way. And very particularly, speaking most recently at the Council, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, it struck me in a way that multilateralism, concepts like that, humanitarian rights, law, this is, these are not a discourse that belongs to any one of us or to a small group, but it belongs to our citizens. And it means we must, in fact, have uh, multilateralism. There is illiteracy that drives it on to be understood as important by our citizens. No more than the same way, if when we speak about the tragic breaches of humanitarian law that are taking place at the present time, that it in fact is something that strikes the conscience of all of our citizens, as well as those who are professionally engaged in a discourse on these issues. I think that this... As well as this, it is perhaps time. I know that some of our governments are very much considering this as the challenge that has been there to the institutional adequacy that, that stands behind multilateralism. We need to look not only just a better connection between these agencies and our peoples, but also to look, look at to test them by effectiveness in relation to the events that are unfolding. Our planet is burning. We have huge threats to biodiversity. We have had two great moments, the moments in relation to sustainable development and uh, also in relation to responding together to climate change. It is incredibly important that we not lose the energy that was released intergenerationally across the peoples of the world in relation to great projects like these. What is important is that we recover our recover our courage to be able uh, to speak uh, uh, about peace, and it's important this is not to ignore any atrocity or to condone in any sense atrocities that are taking place in the war that has been waged at the present time. But I think that, as well, I think it's very very important that the European Union that we speak of realizes as well that. It has a great contribution to make. It is the great, the great representative of the rational basis for human rights, but it isn't the only source of human rights. The great religious systems of the world have been interested in human rights. The Code of Hammurabi is there, as was the oldest code that is in existence. So we must, in fact, approach our invitation to human rights, our invitation to the indivisibility of human rights, without any hubris, but with an openness to wanting to see the benefits together of a shared, responsible, sustainable world. And this means, as we have often said, and in many cases those who read my rather longer speeches will know the case I've made for a better connection between ecology, economy and uh, society. There is so much, of course, it isn't only in relation to all these matters that we share, but I think one of the things that Portugal and Ireland, as members of the European value, is that a, a, a call for a greater interest in matters of culture. I think uh, 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 we will uh, be it in relation to Shano's singing uh, uh, and Fado, 
and so forth. And there's a fine argument as to which influence who which in relation to the long history of music. But we will have an opportunity later on of listening, I think, listening to two great performers, Seamus and Cuiva Flaharte, for their Shannon's performance. I hope it will be it will be get emphasized these connections we share. In the end of the day, in, in all of this, in trying to create what might be a future of hope, culture is very, very important. And it is also, I was th- looking at, uh, 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 Alfred, there is a, I have recently here in Ireland, we have experienced a, a very great church day, but one had only uh, to experience the incredible resilience and kindness of people. There is a, a great instinct still in humanity, a great capacity that is there to be able to bring to fruition all of these great projects such as responding to climate change and sustainability and a better, more responsible relationship to nature. So I think our stories have unfolded in different times, I want to say as well. And it's very interesting we're at the moment looking at how we have in fact managed the telling of that story my own series and government's programme in relation to the decade of commemorations, my own programme in relation to Machner, is an invitation to be able to take all the new information and be able to look at it and respond to it, but most importantly of all, uh, respect the response of others in their different interpretation of what events that were shared. And I know you, President Sousa, have in fact actually given a lead in initiating such a project in Portugal, and I so wish you well with it. It is a very valuable exercise, and good can, can come about. It isn't any more really about rehearsing the arguments of difference, what you might call the violence of difference, versus if you like the grace of discourse on different interpretations. I think there are so many issues that we we, we share together, so many issues that we will go on to even achieve more in the future because we are charged, all of us as global citizens, to find ways of coming together, to tackle together the great crises that I have mentioned. And they are there. There is no point in imagining they are not there. We cannot have matters as they were. There is no such thing as going back to the way that it was. The way that it was gave us a degraded planet, an unequal set of societies, violence. It did not eliminate war. So we must achieve a new moral moment and a new moral conviction. I think that all of this, we must make a better effort, as I've said, to engage our citizens on such values, principles and decisions. And we must communicate the decisions that we take. People sometimes work very, very hard on text and to negotiate to achieve an outcome. But that must become into the conversation of those who are citizens among our peoples. All of this is so important. There's no doubt whatsoever, Besson de Souza, from our conversations in the past, but very particularly from your visit here, I know that it's a great contribution to deepening and strengthening the relationships between the Irish people and the people of Portugal. So many of our people regularly visit and exchange <coughs> with, with each other. So I want to conclude by wishing you every blessing on your visit to Ireland. I have no doubt that my wish is that you would find it stimulating, fruitful and enjoyable. But of the good, one thing I'm certain is that it will enable it to, to, to deepen and strengthen the relationship that already exists between our peoples. And there are so many areas in which we will be able to cooperate, some of which we will discuss tomorrow as we move on in your visit. And we discuss our relationship not only with the sea, but with science, technology, cooperation between our institutions, so many represented uh, here this evening. I'm certain that it will be such a positive result uh, to your visit. And in that spirit, Ahalcha, please join me in a toast to your good health, to the Republic of Portugal and its people, and to the bonds of friendship between our countries and our peoples. May they deepen in conditions of peace and friendship. Bye-bye.